Hello everybody, it's Stu Smith with the Tactical Fitness Report, and this is my good buddy, Alden Mills. Now, Alden Mills and I go way back. In fact, I was just doing the math in my head right before this conversation, and it was 30 years ago this year that we met as freshmen at the Naval Academy. And from there, we pretty much did every bit of our career together, right? We we prepared to get to go to buds and we got buds billets we made it through buds in the same class we graduated buds together and then we went on to stt together which is now called sqt uh, we went uh, to the same seal team together all those little courses that you go in between like seer training and airborne and you know marops you know all those different schools we went through together man we've really done a lot together in each other's weddings and knew each other's wives before we were married and, you know, before we had kids. I mean, this is, this guy has been with me the whole time. You know, he, he knows everything about me, you know, I know everything about him. So we're gonna have some pretty funny discussions today. I would imagine he's a great storyteller. Alden Mills is, uh, he is the inventor of the perfect pushup. If you guys uh, remember that beautiful device that cuts your pushups in half <laughs> just by trying to trying to max them, but it doubles your push-ups when you do them regularly. You know, they make push-ups so much harder. Um, but yeah, after uh, we went to the SEAL teams together, we we went to two different teams after our first tour and uh, two different journeys to or after that. And uh, we both got out after, what, I was in eight years, you were in about eight years? Yeah, seven years. Yeah, so, yeah seven and a half, eight years. And then... Uh, yeah, from there, the, the paths kind of dissected, and now they're back together again. So, uh, Alden, welcome with this uh, little version of two through and after with Alden Mills. So, we're going to talk to you about who you were before Buds. Maybe we can even go back before, before uh, the Naval Academy and kind of lump that all in together because, you know, he, he was a, a rowing athlete you know, that was, uh, pretty much, you know, top of the top of his, uh, game when he did it and, uh, decided to go to bud. So Alden, it's all you buddy. Hey, first of all, Stu, uh, good math. It has been 30 years. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. You no, know? the days are long fair to say you're my first swim buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And, and speaking on that theme of swim buddies, uh, way before I even knew the swim buddy concept existed, that probably would have fallen on the shoulders of my mom. And when you ask about what it was, you know, sum up my young adult years before arriving at the Naval Academy, would probably bring back my most pivotal, pivotal young moment, and that's when I got diagnosed with asthma. Mm. and I'm sitting in this doctor's office, and I've gone through all these tests, you know, tests like blowing in this tube, watching a ping pong ball, trying to keep it between the lines, and, and this doctor creates this beautiful chart with all this data that he's collected from the volume of my lungs to the force of the airflow, and at the end of it, he sits down, and though I'm sitting there, he's really talking to my mom, and he has this real nasally voice, short little guy. And he says, uh, Mrs. Mills, it's quite obvious what's wrong with your son. And she's like, oh, good doctor, do tell me. And he whips out this chart that he spent a couple hours taking all these data from my tests. And he goes, you see this chart? Right here. He has small lungs and he has reactive airway disease. You know what that is? That's, that's called asthma. And I have... Couple recommendations. One, he needs to lead a less active lifestyle. <laughs> and two, he should learn the game of chess. Boom. My shoulders go forward, chin drops to my chest. Mom sees that I'm immediately defeated by those comments. And she says, You know, Alden, why don't you just go wait in the lobby? She talks to the doctor. I'm sitting in the lobby, and I remember these tears dripping down my cheeks and they're forming on that light gray linoleum floor. And I'm having a full pity party for myself and mom comes out and you know how moms, they all have a weapon 
right? Some type of weapon that can break through the noise and get your attention. My mom's weapon, the French long cuticles on her fingernails. <laughs> I swear she, she would sharpen these nails like little velociraptor claws, right? <laughs> Comes up to me, takes my arm, whoo, digs those suckers in there, and I just, I can still feel it. Like, she'd go, look at me. <laughs> Right, I got these big crocodile tears dripping down my cheeks. And she's like, don't you let anyone define your limit. Now, I'll go get you that medicine. But you decide what you can do. Not what that doctor. You understand me? Of course, at that moment, I'm just trying to get her to release the claws right out of my arm. But... I bring that story up because that was a defining moment for me. And I didn't get it at first. And I was crying on the drive home and, and I'm like, mom, chess, like I'm not even good at checkers. <laughs> of course, where's my head going? Right. My head's going new. I'm already thinking about what the doctor wanted me to focus on. He wanted me to focus on being good at chess. And I went to, Oh crap. I suck at checkers. This chess is going to be way difficult for me. <clears throat> and mom got me out of that. And over the next couple of years, she, she said it enough times with my dad's support that they convinced me that, hey, it's up to me to define what I can or can't do. And eventually, because I really was terrible at all ball sports, um, I, I found that, hey, sitting on my butt going backwards, pulling a long stick was, was pretty good for me, right? Hey. And that worked. And, and then that you know, I was able to row my way into the academy. That's that, awesome. Yeah, you were one of the few guys I've ever been able to see that's sitting at like 225, 230 that can still do 30 pull-ups. Yeah, you know, that that helped me. But, man, yeah. did I suck at push-ups. <laughs> and hey, you know you can, pull, you, can pull, you can pull your butt, that's for sure. I can pull uh, it. Man, push it was another that's story. awesome. So, so while you were at the academy, obviously you're crew captain you know, which was a great leaderships, you know, uh, slot for you. And, you know, how, how did that help you kind of uh, take the next level of, you know, getting that Bud's billet and, um, you know, kind of preparing yourself for Bud's specifically? Well, there, I'd say there were a couple of things. I mean, the first one was I didn't really come from a military family. Um, everybody – in one generation or another served. My dad was in the Air Force for four years as an intelligence officer. You know, my grandfather served in the Navy as a lawyer. Um, but we weren't like steeped in military tradition. So I knew I had to serve after graduating the academy. And I knew I wanted to serve doing something that most closely resembled probably the brightest spot for me at the academy which was rowing um you know it was a charles dickens tale for me at the academy best of times worst of times i mean you and i met on restriction together yeah i mean that's that's <laughs> so what we all our own demerits but <clears throat> and thank god i did meet you in in there but um the one of the key things that i loved about rowing was the selflessness of the team focus and there were no high point scores, no MVPs. It was about eight people getting those oars in and out of the water at the same time. And that to me, and the fact that we were on the water, because I love being on, in, or under the water, uh, was a perfect segue to look at joining SEAL Team. And and I loved, you know, it sounds kind of weird, but the the suffering of rowing is very analogous to the suffering that occurs as as a, with a swim buddy in SEAL training and then as a platoon in the different workups you do to get ready to go into harm's way. Oh, absolutely. I mean, your work capacity that I would watch you guys, um, you know, before school, you would get up before dawn, get down to that crew house, do something you guys, I guess you guys all got like first period off. So you had to arrange your schedule. So you basically work through first period, you know, out on the water. Right. Yeah, I'd see you after school do the exact same thing. 
I know. And, uh, and working out harder or running perimeters of the Naval Academy and stuff. And I remember watching you guys, and I remember all the guys that were, you know, wanting to go to Buds that were on that crew uh, crew with you. Um, and I'd be playing rugby over here, and I was like, you know, we need really need to up our game because watch all those guys on the crew team over there because they're, you know, we need to start running and swimming before school. You know, and then come to rugby practice, do our rugby practice, and then go do something after rugby practice. You know, I, I think you guys really set a good example for midshipmen, you know, that are that are looking for going to, uh, you know, spec ops training because it's just – you guys do well at spec ops training. You know, crew, crew guys do. Um, you know, and uh, I, I think that the guys that do really well at, at spec ops training are – putting in the time, you know, putting in the time training, whether that is the volume. On a sports team, yeah, on a sports team or it's on their own individual workouts or supplementing their workouts with being on a sports team, something like that. But I mean, you're right. It is volume. It is work capacity. It's not taking naps in the middle of the day, just, you know, in between training sessions, you're working, you're working all day. And uh, I, th I think that was a great preparatory program for you you know, as, uh, as, you know, two or three years prior to going to buds, would you say? It, it, it is and was, and, and there was one other piece, the work volume without question gave you the strength to believe that you could start spec ops training. The other thing that rowing does and which by the way, I think happens with anybody facing some really intense moment, some really dark moment, is that it creates a conversation. And the conversation that occurred the most for us was when we'd have to every Saturday morning, God, I mean, to this day, I still try and get my head out of, oh, I don't have to do an ERG test on Saturday morning. <laughs> but they make you do this 2,500 meter ERG test. And you know, if there was ever a moment where you meet the big guy upstairs, it's, it's in that earth test. Yeah. And you're I, call getting, it, I call it seeing Jesus. Yeah, seeing Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't want to see him this weekend, but they make you see him all the time. And, and that conversation is what I describe as this head versus heart conversation, right? The one where the head's like, why are we doing this, right? The head's whining. It's complaining. It's, it's looking for reasons to get out of it, to not give it 110%. Because, you know, very analogous to SEAL training, when you do a four-mile timed run in SEAL training, they want you to do a faster time the next week, right? Yeah. Well, our coach in rowing, same thing. They want you to do a harder, a faster time on your 2,500 meter pull than you did the week before. And that meant you have to go 110%, right? You got to find another percent every stinking Saturday morning. And to do it means you're seeing Jesus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're at pass out stage. And, and when you have that conversation, that conversation happens with the head and the heart and the heart's like, Hey, why am I doing this? Like, why do I really care? about making this happen. And I think that is the most important piece after you know you can do the volume of the work is understanding why you want to do this. Yeah, I like that one. Now, let's um we both got buds billets. You know, we were um I think what did we send? 19 guys to buds are you? Yeah, I think, you know, Stu, that's a story in itself. Yeah, it is. We, we'll get that. It's a longer story, but uh, <laughs> it, it's a mess. But uh, anyway, that was, uh, we got 19 guys going to Buds. All yep. 19 of us made it. Yep. That was really cool. Um, yeah. What's your theory on that? Because we had uh, a, whole a whole bunch of different people. I mean, not everybody were, were we weren't buddies, not, you know, but we were fairly tied as a group. You know, we, and I think we had something to, uh, to prove, uh, because class yeah, of 90, lost. the year before us lost four guys. That's right. You know, they so they did. Yeah. They lost four guys. Yeah. I, I definitely think we all felt like we had something to prove. We also, uh, those 19 all showed we really wanted to do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There were other people ahead of us that had opportunities and they backed out. Yeah. And 
the 19 that stepped up were the 19 that said, we're all in. And we appreciate that this is more than us. It's representing the Naval Academy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real good point. And I think we kind of formed a little team out of there. I know we weren't all in the same class, but, you know, we were out there roughly at the same time at some point, and we all yeah. you know, kind of hung out on, you know, the weekends and, you know, did things. Uh, I remember before. classmates coming at the end of my hell week going, hey, man, good job. Yeah. You know? And, and your hell week, let's talk about that. Winter hell week. Oh, all yeah. All the officers quit. You know, usually as an ensign, you don't have to worry about being a class leader, but you know, yeah, because you, know, you got lieutenants and lieutenant JGs in front of you. But you know, to be in charge of a buds class and be in charge of a buds class during Hell Week, talk about that one for a second. And a winter uh, Hell Week. You know, I I have to tell you, it it was there were two hard parts for me. I mean, it's three hard parts of Hell Week. You know, one is I had never been up for ninety six hours straight. Yeah. So that's that's an unknown, right? <laughs> Two, uh, it was physically exhausting and as cold as I'd ever been at that point. But three was the thing I wasn't expecting was how demoralizing it was for my ego. In a sp and, and I think the instructors had figured this out, that here I was, this leader coming out of the Navy crew program with 50, 60 guys as the, the captain of the crew. And now I start Hell Week. We start training with 64. By the time we get to Hell Week, we're at 34. And by the Hell Week's over, we're at 18. And throughout that Hell Week process, the instructors were going, sir, you are a horrible leader. Like, all these people are quitting. Like, why do you think you could actually lead a SEAL platoon? You can't even lead a class through Hell Week. Sir, come on. You got to leave. Like, I mean, it was, if you got it once, you'd be like, okay. But, oh, my God, they just, it was constant. That constant conversation that they were gnawing on you, you know, that made some demons of doubt come knocking. Oh, man, I can't tell you, you know, being called the worst officer ever to graduate SEAL traded or not yeah. to graduate, but, you know, to be, before hell week, being the worst officer ever to lead a boat crew or, or whatever. And uh, it does get into you. I think once, you know, here, here's something I've always kind of thought is I think once they realize they can't break you, they can't beat you physically, then they really start getting into your head. And sometimes that will happen at the exact same time they're trying to figure out, but they they really start nailing your head and whether it's about you as a leader or it's about you with a, you know, as a family member, you know, I remember, I remember when they, yeah, Smith, you got a girlfriend you married? Nah. I mean, I got a girlfriend. We're pretty serious. Yeah. I used to have a girlfriend. I used to be married. You know, make sure you really want to do this. Cause it's, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. Not going to, chances are. Oh, by the way, you think you got a girlfriend, but she's probably hanging out with somebody else. Oh, oh you're yeah. I'm talking to you right now because I'm talking to you. Right. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So, and like I said, they get into your head like that. And I know they got into yours a little bit, but you came out really strong because I remember those Buds instructors really liked you as a leader, especially after Hell Week. But uh, they probably yeah, didn't, didn't like, they probably didn't, they probably didn't you let you know that, though. Cause I remember I was, I wasn't in your class at that point, but I remember them talking about you saying, yeah, Alden's he, or Mills, he really stepped up, you know, during that time, you know? Well, uh, I appreciate you saying that at that time. And I still think about it, you know, they, they hammered you to, and, and it was, you know, you enter by the time you've lost, you, know, you already lost half your class before you start. Yeah. Hell yeah. Week. And then you yeah. lose another half. Like had somebody told me I was going to lose 50%, I was like, no way. Most of these guys were stronger and faster than me already. Right. Right. Guys. I think the first thing we tend to look at is like, well, you see how many pull-ups that guy did? You see how fast he can run in the sand? Oh my God. He, he's like a fish, right? You know, you're <laughs> constantly looking at everyone else because they're, they're stronger and they're faster and they're yeah. they can do all these different things. And so eventually I found like, I got to stop even thinking about it. I just got to think about myself yeah, and, and just do it and focus on my fellas. Yeah. Um, 
So it was, it was definitely that to me, thinking back on it, the mental anguish of, of losing half a class was by far the hardest thing for me in Hell Week. Yeah. But, you know, in fairness, you, know, you, you can't blame yourself for that. That is not no. a leadership failure. But no. they will but you play. just don't expect it, right? Because yeah, you're you the only yeah. leader at yeah. that point. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. You know, you, 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 can't, you can't control someone's heart. And they don't want you to. You know, no. they don't, if somebody says they want to quit to you, you got to let them quit. You know? No, and, and, and you know? Stu, yeah, not to sound like I was the Pope on this. Like there were definitely some guys that came out to me looking for inspiration. Yeah. And I'd say, they're like, sir, I, I don't know. I don't think I can make it. I'm like, structure's right over there. Just go <laughs> right there. And talk. But, but here's another guy, and I'm not going to use names, and we'll just call him uh, – uh, Seaman Smith. Hmm. And uh, he came up to me in the bathroom during one of the most unexpected painful moments. You remember we had to wear those tri shorts? Oh my God. Hated and those things. Nobody had gone to the bathroom, meaning sitting down on the toilet yeah. until Tuesday night. So we'd all been peeing in our pants the whole time. You never appreciated what the urine did to the skin when it touched that Tri short, right? Yeah. You pull your tri shorts down for the first time, and these huge swaths of skin are pulled off on your inner thigh. And I remember sitting down on the John, and I'm just crying. I'm like, yeah. that, that just sucked, right? And there was other guys you can hear them whimpering too, and you know, we're whimpering kind of quietly. And then we stand up, and I meet this Seaman Smith in the bathroom, and. He looks at me and he goes, sir, when I uh, walk out of the bathroom, I'm going to quit. And I knew he was a solid guy. I'm like, you're not. I go, look at, look at ourselves in the mirror. Look at the two of us. How hilarious is this? We both had tears running down our eyes. I said, you know, I don't know about you, but I was just was crying while I was taking a dump. <laughs> and, and he looked at me and he goes, yeah. Yeah, I was. I go, do you have any skin left between your thighs? He goes, no. I go, no. you know how painful it's going to be when we get in that, hot, in that cold water? But to, guess what? Pain's going to go away right after that. I'll make a deal with you. You and me, let's just see sunrise together, and then let's have another conversation. Can we make that deal together? Okay. Okay, I'll do it. And we kept that conversation going. We kept the deal going. And do you know what he ended up becoming? He was the honor man of our class. Ah. And you know, nice. there were these moments, and, and that was like the proud moment for me, right? Of course, nobody knew he'd become the honor man of the class, but everybody has that weak moment, and they found each other at just that right time to have the courage to have that conversation openly instead of just committing inside. Yeah. You know. I would have loved to have had a conversation like that with you in that bathroom because <laughs> I was freaking lonely, but, but yeah. having that was yeah. powerful. Right? Yeah, I agree with that. I, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, that's why being a good team player is critical for getting through buds. It really is because there are moments like that with yourself, with others that you don't get through buds by yourself. You know, right. you really do get through with your buddies and, and you want to see each other on the other side of that hell week, or you want to see each other on the other side of dive phase and, you know, going into third phase and right side by side doing shooting and movement drills and stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's the fun stuff, you know, and, uh, and then you all graduate together and your buddies for life, you know, yeah. that's, uh, that's really, that's really powerful. That's, that's a good one. Um, so fast forward a little bit, you and I, um, you know, went to the same SEAL team together, deployed together. Yep. Um, you know, we both wound up, you know, we both wound up getting married, going separate ways. And, um, but we still kept in touch and you went yep. on a journey in business when you got out of the teams and you want to be an entrepreneur. You know, I remember you and I were, you know, some of those long days of, you know, deployments riding on a submarine or something. And, you were writing down stuff that you were going to invent. And I was writing down stuff I was going to write about. And 
I said, yeah, I think I'm going to write some fitness books. You know, I got some good ideas. Do you remember when those first little journals of ideas started? That was when we went through that junior officer training class. Yes. San Diego. And we both had a little extra time. And I remember like, hey, Stu, what do you think of this fitness idea? And I was working on like a fitness chair. Yeah. No, I really like, I want to write a book. And the two of us were also swim buddies creatively. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. We were pushing each other uh, in the, you know, those directions as well. That, that, was, that was a lot of fun. That was the genesis of what we have done. That's right. It really was. And now you have a great story. You go in as much of it as you want to with uh, you know, going to get a business degree from Carnegie Mellon. And then you have this idea that you want to get a patent on it and invent it and take it through the process. What, what, what was that journey like for you? Uh, I, uh, you just share it with us because I know what it was like for you. But uh. So I, I, I will tell you, just, you know, you mentioned business school for a moment. I went to business school because I wanted to transition, right? Because uh, basically all my young adult life had been in the Navy. I, you know, at 18, I joined the Naval Academy. And then here I am, 30, and I'm sitting. And I remember this distinctly. I jumped out of an airplane, my last jump at SEAL Team 2 on a Friday, and essentially on a Monday, I'm sitting in a quantitative skills review class at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, thinking, what the hell have I done? That's a hard transition. Oh, That that is a hard transition. And, and, And then to have my first exam, and this girl is crying next to me. And her name was Stephanie. I'm like, Stephanie, like, what's wrong? Like, are you hurting? Like, why are you crying? She's like, no, you don't understand. I, I just failed this test. And I was like, oh, 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 you have nothing to worry about. Like, you know, the test had, you know, that 60-point problem? Like, I didn't even answer it because I was stuck on my 40-point problem. And so I know I didn't even get 40 points right. So I'm somewhere below 40 points. So don't worry about it. And she looked at me like, what kind of a freak are you? Like you didn't even answer the 60.1. And then uh, her test comes back. And what does she get on her test? A 90. She got a 92. (laughs) She got a 92 (laughs) and I got a 29. (laughs) And, And I'm thinking, and I turn to her and I go, you know, you have nothing to be upset about. No one is shooting at you. You don't have to worry about a parachute opening. You don't have to worry where your next breath is going to come from underwater. You, you, there's all you have to worry about is just what this outcome is of this test. And 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 to me, that was like this defining moment of my interaction with what civilians were really focused on, right? Yeah. And and I lost my way a little bit out of business school because everybody was so focused on. Who's going to get the highest paying job? Um, where are you going to get the most stock options? It's 2000. And my wife and I decided like, hey, let's move to a city neither of us had lived in. It became San Francisco, our decision. And then I got wrapped around the axle of, oh, how quickly can I make a million dollars in stock options working in a software company? And wow, was I miserable? Uh it wasn't even the volume of work, you know, they were long days, but I didn't get it. It didn't resonate with me. I wasn't connecting with the, the bits of putting together a software application. And I went back in the reserves and I just, I missed the camaraderie. I missed what SEAL team represented to me and that purpose driven element and was very close to going back into the military or joining another government agency that worked with the military. And my wife had convinced me like, you know, you've always talked about doing your own startup. Why don't you do it? And part of the inspiration by that point, you had already written a couple of fitness books. And I remember asking you like, Hey Stu, I think I'm going to do a fitness product. And you're like, Oh, finally, you know, after all those years, cause <laughs> that, that was like 10 years after I'd written the first set of, wow. uh, gets the first things. And, um, I went and got a personal training certification. You know, at that point, I think you were already working on your CSCS. Yeah. And, um, I started really getting involved and in understanding, 
you know, the world of professional training. And, and then I created what I thought was the world's greatest fat burning device. That would be the body rev. I had all these wonderful stories about it. And I was like, oh, it's a new category. By the way, I learned the idea of a new category in business school, right? Oh, you want to create a new category? Well, there's something they don't tell you about a new category. And that is you have to educate everybody on what your new category is. And, oh, we call it a rotating weight system. Well, what the hell does that mean? And you'd show the product out. People are like, I don't get it. Like, how does it work? But I told a good story. I raised a million and a half dollars. And from 37 friends and family, and then learned $1,475,000 worth of ways not to launch product. Whew. That was good. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then, the, you know, uh, a group of investors came together. Um, they were all in the financial industry and they said, uh, all in. it's over. You don't even have enough money to pay the accountants and the lawyers shut this thing down, go get a job. You are embarrassing yourself. Ouch. Yeah. That was four years into this. That hurt. So what do I do? You know, I, I got this one little new idea and I was like, well, I'm going to do this idea. And like, there's no money. Stop. It's over. So I go to my father-in-law and they have this wonderful house looking out over the water um, up in Washington state. And I show them my new idea and it's, it's right around sunset mother-in-law and my wife are in the kitchen making dinner. And he's, he's a big guy he used to play football for university of Washington. He's like, uh, all come here, I'm gonna go out <laughs> point together, walks me out on the point, puts my arm, puts his arm over me. He goes, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, pops. Yeah, I can hear you. Good, because I want you to listen to me real clearly. I didn't raise my daughter to marry a bleeping aerobics instructor. You got six months to figure this out. You hear me? Damn. Hard swallow. Uh, yeah, 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 I hear you, pops. Good talk. Come on, let's go get some dinner. You know, I go to dinner and, you know, my mother-in-law is looking at me. Oh, Alden, why aren't you eating dinner? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not hungry. And that new idea was the perfect push-up. Yeah. And, you know, that's that perfect push-up was, was one conversation away from not ever occurring. Yeah. Um, and And I personally give – you know, the resolve that SEAL team gives you to keep going saying, you know what? It ain't over until I say it's over. And, you know, two and a half years later, Inc. Magazine calls and says, hey, you're the fastest growing consumer products company in the country. But it never would have happened if I didn't have one or two people that believed with me in pressing forward when everybody else said it's over. Damn. That's big, man. Yeah. That's really big. Now, uh, brag for me a second. How many yeah. of those perfect push-ups did you make and sell? Uh, in the first year, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell it to you this way. We launched Perfect Push-Up in uh, October of 2006. Might have sold uh, six, 7,000 units. By February of 2008, we had sold a million units of the original version at $40, and we had sold a million units of the inexpensive version, or what we call the basic, just through Walmart in wow. eight months. Wow. And you know, to date, we've probably sold over Oh, I don't know, 6 million pairs of those. But um, what I'm even more proud of is we did 6 million plus pairs. I mean, it's still the number one seller on Amazon, but we sold a million ab carvers. We sold a million pull-ups. We've sold 
a million cooling towels. Nice. We've sold a million iPhone armbands. We've sold a million multi gyms. Um, so if you looked at it as kind of records, like we got That's six really or good. seven platinum records out there. That's really good. And, and you sold your company, which is yep. even cooler. You had a little exit strategy there. Yep. And now let's talk about what you are doing now. What, what is Alden Mills? Following in the footsteps of my swim buddy. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> now, I know you wrote a book. Again, you go first. <laughs> I've watched you. And then I go back out. I'm like, well, I want to do what Stu's doing. <laughs> so you wrote a book, right? Again, Two books, I wrote right? A book back in, um, it was published in November of 2013. And it was originally, it was called, it, it is called Be Unstoppable, The Eight Essential Actions to Succeed at Anything. And the inspiration for that was a buddy of mine from SEAL Team 2 called Neil Roberts. You probably remember him yep. from FTP. Yeah. And Neil came back on his shield in 2003, first SEAL killed in Afghanistan. And I knew he had to write a just-in-case letter to his 18-month-old son. And it was the same year we had our first child, Henry. And I wondered what he, I wondered what Neil had written. And I was like, you know, I'll write a letter to Henry. Uh, four, three more children later, I kept defining that letter and the letter became the book Be Unstoppable. Nice. Um, so that was the original intent. And I thought, you know, I, I, I would self-publish this thing and do 100 copies. Like that was the extent of the inspiration of that book. And, you know, 25,000 copies later, uh, people asked me to start speaking about the book. And, cool. And I found that at the same time, uh, coming out of the fitness industry, it was very frustrating for me to sell all kinds of different widgets and then learn that very few people actually use the widgets, right? Because you want to see people step up and make the transformation they really want to make. And what I've found is the most powerful way for them to make that transition or transformation is helping them create that conversation in the head. The same conversation that the ERG made for you, the same conversation the instructors would make for you in SEAL training, the same conversation you and I would both have on, all right, well, let's go for it. Let's write the book. Let's create the product, right? Let's go into the unknown and go do something, even though everyone else says, oh, that's a stupid idea. You can't do it. <laughs> I like that one. Or you're embarrassing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible, man. I, I, lo I love your story. And it doesn't surprise me one bit that things worked out for you. Because I know who you are. And I know you, you don't give up and you put out. And, you know, that, that's, just, that's just what you do. You know, it's, and it's kind of, uh, I think, one good thing about what, you know, military and special ops world kind of finds is it finds those type of people. You know, yeah. those people find the teams, you, you know what I mean? And I remember just being in awe at, you know, the teammates that we had, you know, that, you know, have gone on to do some really great things too, you know, all self-driven, don't need anybody to tell them what to do or how to do it. You know, they're just going to go do it. So, so what are you, how can people find out about you now? If people are listening right now and say, you know what, I really want to hear about how I can be more unstoppable for my business or for, you know, a, a, you know, function that you're putting on. How, how can people find you for speaking, um, find about your book, um, be unstoppable and, um, you know, uh, your website, you know, what, what is all that? I'll yeah. put it all in the description as well. So that'd be great. So the best way to find me is on the web at Alden dash mills.com. Uh, they can learn about the book there. They can buy the book at Amazon. I pr did the audible version of it. So it's in uh, Kindle audible and hard copy. And I'm pleased to say that I just got picked up by Harper Collins and I'm writing book number two. Oh, nice. Teams. Nice. Now, are you part of a speaking bureau as well? I am. I'm so, part of about seven bureaus. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, speak around the world All on, right. on Be Unstoppable and Build Unstoppable Teams. Nice. Nice. Where do you find that most people want to hear about 
your story and what you have to say? Is it with corporations that are in in a change uh, mentality or you know a, a transition of some sorts, or they just been bought out and they got a whole new culture that they're trying to create? What what are you finding that's uh, most general for you? I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head with the very first word. Like all those things you just listed as examples, it's all dealing with change, right? Oh, okay. New leadership, whether it's launching a new product, mm. whether it's how are we going to go from point A to point B, how do we improve from X to Y, uh, it all has to do with helping us get a framework for inspiring ourselves, our team to go past what we originally thought was possible. Love it. That's what I talk about. I love it. I I think, you know, your story is really personifies that, you know, your body is 10 times stronger than your brain will let it be, you know, but at the same time, you know, once you have discovered that you also realize that it's your brain that's letting you do this, you know, but you got to train the brain to do that, you know, and you got to see, you got to push yourself to that point of where you're almost failing, but you're not, you don't quit. Right. And, um, I love it. Love the story. Um, you got any, anything else you want to share? Um, what, what's next for you? Uh, well, spending a lot of time on, on this book uh, a couple of years ago, I started another little company with my buddy who was my CFO and partner at Perfect Fitness, and we created a pet food company called Presidio Natural, and that's chugging right along with our first little, we originally started with a little product called Fetch Fuel, my firstborn or my dog, <laughs> now two dogs, we just got another dog, Labradors. And so, you know, I still love inventing widgets, coming up with new ideas, um, but I really enjoy and embrace, I've been doing coaching, speaking, and writing. Nice. Nice work. Well, everybody, this is Alden Mills, and you can find out more about him in the description and uh, alden-mills.com, right? Be unstoppable. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're looking for a motivational speaker, this is your man right here. And, uh, so anyway, this is two through and after with Alden Mills and, uh, congratulations. You are 100th podcast that I have done. There you go. Uh, I'm honored to be there, swim buddy. Number 100 podcast for uh, the tactical fitness report that we kind of went off on a different tangent today, but that's, that's cool. This was a that's good, awesome. This was a good, a, that's a real honor, Stu. And I'm right, so man. proud of what you're doing, buddy. Keep it up. Thank you. You too. And everybody, come back. We'll, uh, we'll be at uh, Podcast 101 in another week. Come see us.